I know what you're thinking. Like, why does that guy get to sit down? That's because this is radio. I tell radio stories about design, and I report on all kinds of stories: buildings, and toothbrushes, and mascots, and wayfinding, and fonts. My mission is to get people to engage with the design that they care about, so they begin to pay attention to all forms of design. When you decode the world with design intent in mind, the world becomes kind of magical. Instead of seeing the broken things, you see all the little bits of genius that anonymous designers have sweated over to make our lives better. And that's essentially the definition of design: making life better and providing joy. And few things give me greater joy than a well-designed flag. Yeah. Happy 50th anniversary on your flag, Canada! It is beautiful, gold standard. Love it. I'm kind of obsessed with flags. Sometimes I bring up the topic of flags, and, and、uh, people are like, "I don't, I don't care about flags." And and then we start talking about flags, and trust me, 100% of people care about flags. There's just something about them that works on our emotions. My family wrapped my Christmas presents as flags this year, and including the.、Uh, Blue、uh, gift bag that's dressed up as the as the flag of Scotland. I, I put this picture online, and, and sure enough, within the first few minutes, someone left a comment that said, "You can take that Scottish saltire and shove it up your ass." <laughs> Which, see, people are passionate about flags. You know, that's the way it is. What I love about flags is that once you understand the design of flags, what makes a good flag, what makes a bad flag, you can understand the design of almost anything. So. What I'm going to do here is I'm going to kind of crack open an episode of my radio show, 99% Invisible, and I'm going to reconstruct it here on stage. So when I when I press a button over here, S for sound, it's going to make a sound. And so whenever you hear a sound or a voice or a piece of music, it's because I pressed a button. Sound. All right. Got it. Here we go. Three, two. This is 99% Invisible. I'm Roman Mars. The five basic principles of flag design. According to the North American Vexillological Association, vexillological. Vexillology is the study of flags. It's that extra law that makes it sound weird. Number one, keep it simple. The flag should be so simple that a child can draw it from memory. Before I moved to Chicago in 2005, I didn't even know cities had their own flags. Most larger cities do have flags. Well, I didn't know that. That's Ted K, by the way. Hello. He's a flag expert. He's a totally awesome guy. I'm Ted K. I have edited a scholarly journal on flag studies, and I'm currently involved with the Portland Flag Association and the North American Vexillological Association. Ted literally wrote the book on flag design. Good flag, bad flag. It's, it's more of a pamphlet, really. It's about 16 pages. Yes, it's called Good Flag, Bad Flag: How to Design a Great Flag. And that first city flag I discovered in Chicago is a beaut: white field, two horizontal blue stripes, and four six-pointed red stars down the middle. Number two, use meaningful symbolism. The blue stripes represent the water, the river, and the lake. The flag's images, colors, or patterns should relate to what it symbolizes. The red stars represent significant events in Chicago's history, namely the founding of Fort Dearborn on the future site of Chicago, the Great Chicago Fire, the World Columbian Exposition, which everyone remembers because of the White City, and the Century of Progress Exposition, which no one remembers at all. Number three, use two to three basic colors. The basic rule for colors is to use two to three colors from the standard color set: red, white, blue, green, yellow, and black. The design of the Chicago flag has complete buy-in with an entire cross section of the city. It is everywhere. Every municipal building flies the flag. Like, there's probably at least one store in every block near where I work that sells some sort of Chicago flag paraphernalia. That's Wet Moser from Chicago Magazine. Today, just for example, I went to get a haircut, and when I sat down on the barber's chair, there was a Chicago flag on the box that the barber has kept all his tools in, and then in the mirror, there was a Chicago flag on the wall behind me. When I left, the guy passed me who had a Chicago flag badge on his backpack. 
It's adaptable and remixable. The six-pointed stars in particular show up in all kinds of places. The coffee I bought the other day had a Chicago star on it. It's a distinct symbol of Chicago pride. When a police officer or a firefighter dies in Chicago, often it's not the flag of the United States on his casket. It can be the flag of the city of Chicago. That's how deeply the flag has gotten into the civic imagery of Chicago. And it isn't just that people love Chicago and therefore love the flag. I also think that people love Chicago more because the flag is so cool. A positive feedback loop there between great symbolism and civic pride. Okay, so when I moved back to San Francisco in 2008, I researched its flag because I had never seen it in the previous eight years I lived there, and I found it. I am sorry to say, sadly lacking. I know. It hurts me too. Well, let me start from the top. Number one, keep it simple. Keeping it simple. The flag should be so simple that a child can draw it from memory. It's a relatively complex flag. <sighs> okay, here we go. Okay, the main component of the San Francisco flag is a phoenix representing the city rising from the ashes after the devastating fires of the 1850s. A powerful symbol for San Francisco. I still don't really dig the Phoenix. Design-wise, it manages to both be too crude and have too many details at the same time. Which, if you were trying for that, you wouldn't be able to do it. <laughs> and it just looks bad at a distance. But having deep meaning puts that element in the plus column. Behind the Phoenix, the background is mostly white, and then it has a substantial gold border around it, which is a very attractive design element. I think it's okay, but. Here come the big no-nos of flag design. Number four: no lettering or seals. Never use writing of any kind. Underneath the phoenix, there's a motto on a ribbon that translates to "Gold in peace, iron in war." Plus, and this is the big problem: it says San Francisco across the bottom. If you need to write the name of what you're representing on your flag, your symbolism has failed. The United States flag doesn't say like USA across the front. In fact, country flags, you know, they tend to behave so, like hats off to South Africa and Turkey and Israel and Somalia and Japan and Gambia. There's a bunch of really great country flags, but they obey good design principles because the stakes are high. They're on the international stage, but city, state, and regional flags are another story. There is a scourge. Of bad flags, <laughs> and they must be stopped. <laughs> that is the truth, and that is the dare. The first step is to recognize that we have a problem. <laughs> a lot of people tend to think that good design is just a matter of taste, and you know, and quite honestly, sometimes it is actually, but sometimes it isn't. All right. Here's the full list of NAVA flag design principles. The five basic principles of flag design: number one, keep it simple. Keep it simple. Number two, use meaningful symbolism. Number three, use two to three basic colors. Number four, no lettering or seals. Never use writing of any kind because you can't read that at a distance. Number five, and be distinctive. All the best flags tend to stick to these principles, and like I've said before, like most country flags are okay. But here's the thing. If you showed this list of principles to any designer of almost anything, they would say these principles—simplicity, deep meaning,、uh, having few colors, or being thoughtful about colors, uniqueness, don't have writing you can't read—all those principles apply to them too. But sadly, good design principles are rarely invoked in U.S. city flags. Our biggest problem seems to be that fourth one: we just can't stop ourselves from putting our names on our flags or like little. Municipal seals with tiny writing on them. Here's the thing about municipal seals: they were designed to be on pieces of paper, where you can read them, not on flags 100 feet away, flapping in the breeze. So here's a bunch of flags again.、Uh, vexillologists call these SOBs, seals on a bedsheet. And <laughs> if, if, if you can't tell what city they go to, yeah, that's that's exactly the problem. Except for Anaheim, apparently they they fixed it. Uh, uh, These flags are everywhere in the U.S. 
the European equivalent of the municipal seal is the, is the city coat of arms. And this is where we can learn a lesson for how to do things right. So this is the city coat of arms of Amsterdam. Now, if this were a United States city, the flag would probably look like this. You know, <laughs> yeah. Uh, but instead, the flag of Amsterdam looks like this. Rather than plopping the whole coat of arms on a solid background and writing Amsterdam below it, they just take the key elements of the escutcheon, the shield, and they turn it into the most badass city flag in the world. <laughs> And, and because it's so badass, those flags and crosses are found throughout Amsterdam, just, just like Chicago, they're used. Even though a seal on a bedsheet flags are particularly painful and offensive to me, uh, nothing can quite prepare you for one of the biggest train wrecks in vexillological history. <laughs> are you ready? It's the flag of Milwaukee, Wisconsin. I mean, it's, it's distinctive. Uh, I'll give him that. It was adopted in 1955. Uh, the city ran a contest and gathered a bunch of submissions with all kinds of designs. And an alderman by the name of Fred Steffen cobbled together parts of the submissions to make what is now the Milwaukee flag. It's a kitchen sink flag. There's a gigantic gear representing industry. There's a ship recognizing the port, a giant stalk of wheat paying homage to the brewing industry. It's a hot mess. And Steve Kotis, a graphic designer from Milwaukee, wants to change it. It is, it's, it's really awful. It's a misstep on the city's behalf, to say the least. <laughs> But what puts the Milwaukee flag over the top, almost to the point of self-parody, is on it is a picture of the Civil War battle flag of the Milwaukee Regiment. So that's the final element in it that just makes it that much more sort of ridiculous, that there is you know, a flag design within the On design the of flag. the yeah. Milwaukee flag. Yeah. Yeah. Now, Milwaukee is a fantastic city. I've been there. I love it. The most depressing part of this flag, though, is that there have been two major redesign contests. The last one was held in 2001. 105 entries were received. But in the end, the members of the Milwaukee Arts Board decided that none of the new entries were worthy of flying over the city. They couldn't agree to change that thing. <laughs> That's discouraging enough to make you think that good design and democracy just simply do not go together. <laughs> But Steve Kotis is going to try one more time to redesign the Milwaukee flag. I believe Milwaukee is a great city. Every great city deserves a great flag. Steve isn't ready to reveal his design yet. One of the things about proposing one of these things is you have to like, get people on board, and then you reveal your design. But here's the trick. If you want to design a great flag, a kick-ass flag, like Chicago's or DC's, which also has a great flag, start by drawing a one by one and a half inch rectangle on a piece of paper. Your design has to fit within that tiny rectangle. Here's why. A three by five foot flag on a pole 100 feet away looks about the same size as a one by one and a half inch rectangle seen about 15 inches from your eye. You'll be surprised at how compelling and simple the design can be when you hold yourself to that limitation. Meanwhile, back in San Francisco, is there anything we can do? I like to say that in every bad flag, there's a good flag trying to get out. The way to make San Francisco's flag a good flag is to take the motto off, because you can't read that at a distance. Take the name off, and the border might even be made thicker, so it's more a part of the flag. And I would simply take the phoenix and make it a great big element in the middle of the flag. With the current phoenix, that's got to go. I would simplify or stylize the phoenix depict a big, wide-winged bird coming out of flames. Emphasize those flames. So this San Francisco flag was designed by Frank Camaro based on Ted Kaye's suggestions. I don't know what he would do if he was completely unfettered and, and didn't, have, didn't follow those guidelines. Fans of my radio show and podcast, they've heard me complain about bad flags. They've sent me other suggested designs. This one's by Neil Musset. Both are so much better. <laughs> and I think if they were adopted, I would see them around the city 
In my crusade to make flags of the world more beautiful, many listeners have taken it upon themselves to redesign their flags and look into the feasibility of getting them officially adopted. If you see your city flag and like it, fly it. Even if it violates a design rule or two, I don't care. But if you don't see your city flag, maybe it doesn't exist. But maybe it does, and it just sucks. And I dare you to join the effort to try to change that. As we move more and more into cities, the city flag will become not just a symbol of that city as a place, but also it could become a symbol of how that city considers design itself. Especially today, as the populace is becoming more design aware, and I think design awareness is at an all-time high. A well-designed flag could be seen as an indicator of how a city considers all of its design systems: its public transit, its parks, its signage. It might seem frivolous, but it's not. Often, when city leaders say we have more important things to do than worry about a city flag, my response is. If you had a great city flag, you would have a banner for people to rally under to face those more important things. I've seen firsthand what a good city flag can do in the case of Chicago. The marriage of good design and civic pride is something that we need in all places. The best part about municipal flags is that we own them. They are an open source, publicly owned design language of the community. When they are done well, they are. Remixable, adaptable, and they are powerful. We could control the branding and graphical imagery of our cities with a good flag, but instead, by having bad flags we don't use, we cede that territory to sports teams and chambers of commerce and tourism boards. Sports teams can leave and break our hearts. And besides, some of us, you know, don't really care about sports. And tourism campaigns can just be cheesy. But a great city flag. Is something that represents a city to its people and its people to the world at large. And when that flag is a beautiful thing, that connection is a beautiful thing. So maybe all the city flags can be as inspiring as Hong Kong or Portland or Trondheim, and we can do away with all the bad flags like San Francisco, Milwaukee, Cedar Rapids. And finally, when we're all done, we can do something about Pocatello, Idaho. Considered by the North American Vexillological Association as the worst city flag in North America. Yeah, that thing has a trademark symbol on it, people. That, that hurts me just to look at. Thank you so much for listening. I know what you're thinking. Like, why does that guy get to sit down? That's because this is radio. I tell radio stories about design, and I report on all kinds of stories: buildings, and toothbrushes, and mascots, and wayfinding, and fonts. My mission is to get people to engage with the design that they care about, so they begin to pay attention to all forms of design. When you decode the world with design intent in mind, the world becomes kind of magical. Instead of seeing the broken things, you see all the little bits of genius that anonymous designers have sweated over to make our lives better. And that's essentially the definition of design: making life better and providing joy. And few things give me greater joy than a well-designed flag. Yeah. Happy 50th anniversary on your flag, Canada! It is beautiful, gold standard. Love it. I'm kind of obsessed with.、Flag. I'm Roman Mars. The five basic principles of flag design. According to the North American Vexillological Association, vexillological. Vexillology is the study of flags. It's that extra law that makes it sound weird. Number one, keep it simple. The flag should be so simple that a child can draw it from memory. 
Before I moved to Chicago in 2005, I didn't even know cities had their own flags. Most larger cities do have flags. Well, I didn't know that. That's Ted Kay, by the way. Hello. He's a flag expert. He's a totally awesome guy. I'm Ted Kay. I have edited a scholarly journal on flag studies, and I'm currently involved with the Portland Flag Association and the North American Vexillological Association. Ted literally wrote the book on flag design. Good flag, bad flag. It's, it's more of a pamphlet, really. It's about 16 pages. Yes, it's called Good Flag, Bad Flag, How to Design a Great Flag. And that first city flag I discovered in Chicago is a beaut. White field, two horizontal blue stripes, and four six-pointed red stars down the middle. Number two, use meaningful symbolism. The blue stripes represent the water, the river, and the lake. The flag's images, colors, or patterns should relate to what it symbolizes. The red stars... Flags. Sometimes I bring up the topic of flags, and, and uh, people are like, I don't, I don't care about flags. And, and then we start talking about flags, and trust me, 100% of people care about flags. There's just something about them that works on our emotions. My family wrapped my Christmas presents as flags this year, and including the uh, blue uh, gift bag that's dressed up as the, as the flag of Scotland. I, I put this picture online, and, and sure enough, within the first few minutes, someone left a comment that said, you can take that Scottish saltire and shove it up your ass. <laughs> Which, see, people are passionate about flags, you know? That's the way it is. What I love about flags is that once you understand the design of flags, what makes a good flag, what makes a bad flag, you can understand the design of almost anything. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to kind of crack open an episode of my radio show, 99% Invisible, and I'm going to reconstruct it here on stage. So when I, when I press a button over here... S for sound. It's going to make a sound. And so whenever you hear a sound or a voice or a piece of music, it's because I pressed a button. S sound. All right. Got it? Here we go. In three, two... This is 99% Invisible. Represents significant events in Chicago's history. Namely, the founding of Fort Dearborn on the future side of Chicago, the Great Chicago Fire, the World Columbian Exposition, which everyone remembers because of the White City, and the Century of Progress Exposition, which no one remembers at all. Number three, use two to three basic colors. The basic rule for colors is to use two to three colors from the standard color set, red, white, blue, green, yellow, and black. The design of the Chicago flag has complete buy-in with the entire cross-section of the city. It is everywhere. Every municipal building flies the flag. Like, there's probably at least one store in every block near where I work that sells some sort of Chicago flag paraphernalia. That's Wet Moser from Chicago Magazine. Today, just for example, I went to get a haircut, and when I sat down on the barber's chair, there was a Chicago flag on the box that the barber has kept all his tools in, and then in the mirror, there was a Chicago flag on the wall behind me. When I left, a guy passed me who had a Chicago flag badge on his backpack. It's adaptable and remixable. The six-pointed stars in particular show up in all kinds of places. The coffee I bought the other day had a Chicago star on it. It's a distinct symbol of Chicago pride. When a police officer or a firefighter dies in Chicago, often it's not the flag of the United States on his casket. It can be the flag of the city of Chicago. That's how deeply the flag has gotten into the civic imagery of Chicago. And it isn't just that people love Chicago and therefore love the flag. I also think that people love Chicago more because the flag is so cool. A positive feedback loop there between great symbolism and civic pride. OK, so when I moved back to San Francisco in 2008, I researched its flag because I had never seen it in the previous eight years I lived there. And I found it, I am sorry to say, sadly lacking. I know. It hurts me, too. <laughs> well, let me start from the top. Number one, keep it simple. Keeping it simple. The flag should be so simple that a child can draw it from memory. It's a relatively complex flag. <sighs> OK, here we go. OK, the main component of the San Francisco flag is a phoenix, representing the city rising from the ashes after the devastating fires of the 1850s. A powerful symbol for San Francisco. I still don't really dig the Phoenix. Design-wise, it manages to both be too crude and have too many details.